through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History, and now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strong. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Channeling History. We're the only show where we speak to the souls that made things happen. They're all on the other side, and we're brought to you on the Parix Radio Network. I'm Barry Strom, your host, and I'll be doing the channeling tonight. And I would like to thank you all for tuning in to our show this evening. I'm Connie Strom, your co-host. This week, we'll be channeling three famous gunfighters and lawmen of the Old West, Wild Bill Hickok, Wyatt Earp, and Buffalo Bill Cody. You'll learn a lot about the truth of the Old West tonight. So please tell your friends about it so we can continue to grow our audience and get that education out there. Okay, let me throw in a quick disclaimer. The opinions or statements voiced on our show are the channeled words of the spirits, do not necessarily reflect our opinions, those of the Parax Network, or of our sponsors. Last week we had another really interesting show pertaining to the Western Frontier, where we interviewed Daniel Boone, Jim Bridger, and Kit Carson. Now, all of our shows are available on our YouTube channel. It's in my name, Barry Strom. Or if you'd like to download them, go to Podomatic.com and just search Channeling History. You can also hear us on Spotify, Audible, iTunes, Pandora, and even some of the other platforms. We'll welcome your questions tonight through the chat room. While we do have questions prepared for our guests, we welcome your participation and look forward to your questions. We get some very interesting ones out of our chat room from time to time. Now, before we channel, we always say a prayer of protection. So, Connie, let's say the prayer, and then we're going to get on to speak with these three incredible and famous men of the Old West. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. Grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from all things that will harm us. Keep the messages positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our egos. We ask these things in the light of the seen, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Amen. Okay, Connie, uh, I've been looking forward to this one as well, so let's get started. We're going to begin with Bill Hickok. Now, Wild Bill Hickok was born in 1837 and died in Deadwood, Dakota Territory, of a gunshot wound. He was a well-known folk hero of the Old West, famous for his gunfights and a bit of a character. So, Connie, let's, I know Wild Bill's here is with us, so let us begin. Yes. Welcome, Bill. Uh, you were born in northern Illinois. Why did you leave and go west? There were just so many reasons to go west. Illinois was getting fairly tame. There was a lot of gold, silver, many good things going on out west, a lot of excitement. The days of the fur trappers were pretty well gone by the time I grew up, but it was great. I wanted to go there. I thought it was an opportunity, and I did my best. So how would you describe your youth? wouldn't say I was too well behaved. (laughs) I was a bit wild. I was a fairly big man, so I must admit that maybe I got into a few more fights than I should have. Didn't take a whole lot of crap from anyone. It was... It was a time where you had to defend yourself, and I taught myself to defend. So it was, uh, I guess you could say that I wasn't the best, nicest person in the world. <laughs> uh, what were your activities during the Civil War? Tried to join. It's a bit on the young side. Finally got in, but didn't uh, last too long with them. I was definitely on the Union side, didn't want any part of the slavery thing, but it was was a terrible time. I was living in an area where we had a lot of dissension. Some thought there should be slavery, some thought there shouldn't. Many people were 
were fighting among themselves, a lot of guerrilla warfare. But it was, uh, it was a very nasty time in the West. Indeed it was. Uh, will you tell us about the Bleeding Kansas era and the role that you played in the hostilities during this time? Kansas was trying to come into the Union. There were a lot of arguments whether it should be slavery allowed or whether slavery should be abolished. People were fighting back and forth about it, as I spoke earlier. It was a time that slavery was tearing the country apart. I was very opposed to it, but it was, it was just the way things were. The whole country was being torn apart. It wasn't just Kansas, Missouri, all the border states where the question of slavery was, was being asked. A lot of guerrilla warfare, as I said earlier. Many people died. It was just a terrible time in American history. Indeed it was. In 1860, you were badly injured by a bear. Would you please tell us about that incident? I was, I was riding. I thought on my, I was in a wagon, and all of a sudden there was a, a bear with its cub in front of us. She wasn't real pleased that we were there, and she attacked us, and the horses was, ran off. I found that I was in a bit of a hand-to-hand contact with her, I fired a shot at her. Damn bullet bounced off her skull. She grabbed me, and I managed to cut her throat with my knife, but not after she uh, did a bit of damage to me. Took, took quite a while to heal from it, but in those days you had to be really careful with infection and things, and I was really lucky to recover from it. Indeed. Was David McCandless the first man that you killed? And if he was, could you tell us about that? Well, I think that he was. He was an individual that didn't care for me. So he was bragging about that he thought that uh, he was going to kill this young kid. Came came after me, and he found out it didn't work out too well for him. So I would say that, yeah, he was probably the first one. I thought that I had accidentally, that I had killed another person prior to that, but it didn't happen like that. McCandless was, was the first one that I'm really sure that I put a bullet in. How old were you? At the time that I, I killed him, I was about 16. Wow. How many men did you kill in gunfights? Well, not quite as many as, I, as people were attributed to me. I would say that if you counted all the, the ones that wound up dying when I shot them, I'd say it was about eight. In 1862, you were discharged by the Union Army. Why did they do that? Well, they thought that I was uh, not exactly keeping the paperwork fine. I guess that uh, they didn't like the way that I was doing things, so they decided it was time for me to leave. In 1865, you killed Davis Tutt in a gunfight. Will you tell us the details of that gunfight? Well, that was one of the more interesting ones. He and I squared off. He didn't like me, and I didn't like him. Said he was going to kill me like the other ones thought they could. I was a pretty good shot. So we we got out in the street, and I always turned my side to him. There were a lot of these fools that would get into a fight and put their whole body in. But I always tried to turn my side so that they didn't have as big a target to hit. He did the same thing. Actually, it wasn't a quick draw. 
We took he took an aim and missed. I took an aim and didn't miss. Hit him. Went through his heart, and that was the end of that one. This might be a silly question, but how did you get the nickname Wild Bill? As I said earlier, I guess I wasn't the kindest person or nicest person in the world. I thought that I should probably do what I wanted to do, and if anybody wanted to stop me, they had their hands full. Seems as though people started writing some articles and stories about me, which were maybe had a few slight exaggerations in it. They started to uh, make these little dime novels, which were very popular at the time. Greenhorns back back east just simply loved to read this stuff, and they started to use uh, nickname Wild Bill because they were exaggerating everything I was doing. Some of it was true, but uh, yeah, probably a pretty accurate name. <laughs> so what was your opinion towards the Indians? The Indians were trying to kill us in those days. I was fighting them. We had a lot of Indians that uh, didn't like what the white men were doing, and rightfully so. White man was coming out, settlers were taking their land. All you had to do was find silver or gold on their properties, and they were gone. The Indians were definitely mistreated, and they were, but they were fighting back. I started fighting them at a young age, and must admit, I did kill quite a few of them. Didn't count those in the number when you asked me. But the Indians... They were they were very brutal. They wanted to scalp me as much as I wanted to scalp them. When things quieted down, I did realize that they were being mistreated and stuffed onto reservations. The older I got, the more I realized that they were just kind of trying to preserve their way of life. So there's always two sides to a story. That is true. In 1869, you were elected the city marshal of Hayes, Kansas. What was it like being a city marshal during those times? Well, you had to be tough. Keep in mind, everybody was carrying a gun in those days. The big, the only entertainment was either in a, in a whorehouse or in a saloon, and everybody would come in, get drunk. They would do what they wanted to do. If you were a lawman, it was your job to protect the people. You had to break up a fight. And sometimes you just had to beat them over the head. If you if beating them over the head didn't work, then, well, sometimes you had to shoot them. But it was uh, very difficult and it was a very dangerous life. Most of the lawmen weren't tough enough, and they wound up getting a bullet. But it was uh, it was something that had a had to take place. Somebody had to tame those cowboys down. Many of them had been out on the range for months, hadn't seen humans, couldn't wait to get drunk, couldn't wait to go see the ladies. So it was a very dangerous time. Many of them thought they could come in and just shoot a town up. Uh, we were the ones that had to tell them they couldn't. Okay, while well, you were Marshal and Hayes, you killed an individual named Bill Mavay. Will you tell us about that incident? Yeah, he was another guy that didn't care too much for me. Had to a, had a step in, had to do things I had to do. I do have him in my numbers that I included. Okay, in 1871, you became the Marshal of Abilene, Kansas. John Wesley Hardin was well, a well-known gunfighter and outlaw that had killed 27 men. What was your relationship with Hardin, and did you ever have any altercations with him? He was under an assumed name. I pretty much knew who he was. Wes was a pretty good guy. Actually enjoyed being with him. 
He was rough and tumble, same as I was. He was he was really he was hard and he was really fast and a great shot. Figured I'd be better off not getting into a tussle with him. Thought I could beat him, but I didn't want to take a chance on it. Wes wasn't really doing anything wrong in my town. I think he understood that if he got in a tussle with me, he'd have a pretty good, be about a 50-50 shot. So, even though I did realize who he was and that he was wanted, we just kind of were friendly. He was a good guy. Time came when he left town, and everything worked out well. What made you decide to stop being a law enforcement agent? Things were quieting down. I did kind of thrive on the excitement. Wanted to get out. Wanted to do other things. Wanted to pursue making some money. I was also a professional gambler. Many of us in those days took advantage of the miners. They'd come into town. Didn't know much about gambling, so we'd teach them a lesson. I just thought that being in law enforcement, I'd done it long enough, and it was time to go on, to move on to something else. What was your opinion of Annie Oakley? Didn't think too much of her. She had been on some of the wagon trains that I'd been leading. She was in some of the towns where I was. She was a drunk, used drugs at the time. Nasty, nasty woman. But she was a pretty good shot, but did not think a whole lot of her. Okay, in 1876, you were playing poker in Deadwood, Dakota, in the Dakota Territory. Will you tell us what happened there? Well, that was kind of the end of the story. I was playing poker in Deadwood, and I had taken this month. Played a game with this guy the day before, took most of his money, gave him some cash to buy breakfast, felt sorry for him. Guy was a pretty bad gambler. Came into the into the bar, got one to sit in on a game. Now usually I'd sit into a game, I'd sit with my back to the wall, because I knew there were people who didn't care a whole lot for me. In this case, the only seat that was there had my back to the door. This guy comes in, takes his forty five and puts a bullet in the back of my head. Never really realized too much what was going on, but that was pretty much the end of it. Yes, I was actually in that bar several years ago. Uh, please tell us about your relationship with Buffalo Bill Co- Cody. I met Bill when we were both pretty young. We were guides, working as guiding the army or private groups. Bill was always a great guy. I liked him very much. We always got along real well. Even took a short spin on his Wild West show. That didn't work out too great. But Bill Cody, I thought he was just a wonderful person. He was one of the few people that I got along with. He was pretty rough and tumble as well. And I'm glad he's here with me tonight. It's good seeing him again. Thank you so much, Wild Bill, for joining us. Do you have a final message for our listeners? Yes, I do. I'd like everyone to understand just how difficult law enforcement can be. Now, in my day, everybody carried a gun and everybody got drunk and everybody went into the whorehouses. So it was a difficult time. Today, things are a lot different. Now your politicians are the ones that are picking on law enforcement, policemen. Don't let them do their job. Won't let them stand up to up to the bad people. Make sure they're politically correct. Can you imagine if I tried to be a lawman today? I was not exactly <laughs> what you'd call political correct. You need to respect them. They're out there to save your life. When you when you get in trouble. You call a lawman. You don't call these politicians because then the last ones are going to come help you. So thank you for having me today. 
appreciated the opportunity. I know the other boys here are waiting to talk. Yes, it's been fun talking with you, Bill. Thank you. Okay. Wyatt Earp was an American lawman, gambler, born in 1848 and died in 1929. He and his brothers, along with Doc Holliday, participated in the famous gunfight at the OK Corral. He's here with us tonight. Connie, let's talk with Wyatt. Welcome, Wyatt. In the 1870s, Peoria, Illinois, had a reputation as a wide-open town. Will you tell us about your time in Peoria? I did, I did spend quite a bit of time in Peoria. Kind of liked it. Actually had had a brothel there. It was keep in mind people don't understand that in the after Civil War, Illinois wasn't the tamest state in the world. Spent a bunch of time there. Figured out that uh I ought to try some different things. But enjoyed it. Okay. In 1871, you got your first job in law enforcement in Peoria. Why did you end up leaving that job? Seems as though when they did some of the paperwork, they found out that there was a little bit of money missing. And they kind of thought that I was behind it. So I, they asked me to, uh, if I would not be a member of their law enforcement community anymore. So I just simply went back to my my home with the ladies, and that's where I continued to uh, watch out for them, worked as a bouncer, and just took care of my business. In 1874, you moved from Peoria to Wichita, Kansas. Why did Why that move? Figured there was a lot more opportunity in the West. Peoria, the population was decreasing then. People were leaving to go further West. The cattle herds, the cattle barons, they were driving their their cattle north into the Wichita area. I figured if those cowboys were out, out, there for three, four months that maybe they could use a couple more houses with a couple women in them. Thought it might be a good way to uh, make a little more money. Knew that those cowboys would be paid when they got there. And also, I was a pretty good gambler, so I figured I might be able to help them out in spending some of that money. So we moved to, to Wichita, and I wasn't disappointed. So what was your initial occupation in Wichita? I did uh, did open a couple homes for the women out there, and they did a pretty good job getting the money from the cowboys when they came to town. So in the beginning, I didn't think too much about law enforcement. But as time came on, I thought, well, maybe I'll take – Another hand at it. Is there anything in particular that in particular that made you come to that decision? I figured that if you're in law enforcement, you can maybe avoid a few of the problems that you run into if you aren't. They also needed to control some of those cowboys coming into town. It was Wichita in those days was a wild town. A lot of violence, a lot of danger for people. So I thought maybe I could try a hand at law enforcement. Will you tell us about Doc Holliday and the time he actually saved your life? There were some cowboys in the bar, and they were raising hell. They were firing their guns and shooting the mirrors out in the, in, in the bar. And idiot that I was, I came flying through the through the door, and all of a sudden I was looking at three or four cowboys that had guns aimed at me. Well, there was a leader, and Doc was playing cards back in the corner. And we had been friends. We'd talked before, got along with him really well. 
So I'm all of a sudden I'm looking at all these guys with guns and I'm thinking this maybe not going to end real well. Well, Doc takes his gun out and puts it to the back of the head of the lead cowboy and says, if you don't put the guns away, I'm going to blow your head off. They listen to him, put the guns away, and I do really think that that could have been had been a had a real bad ending for me had Doc not intervened. Yes, <laughs> tell us about your time in Tombstone, Arizona, and that famous gunfight at the OK Corral, which took place, I believe, in eighteen eighty one. Things had quieted down in Wichita, so we moved down to Tombstone. My brother was with me. Doc followed us down to Tombstone. We had we had a time there. We by this time we were marshals and trying to preserve law and order. There was a group of rustlers called cowboys down there. They were mean and nasty people. They felt that they really could do what they wanted to and We'd gotten in several arguments in the past. They started talking about wanting to kill me and my brothers, which I didn't think was the best of ideas. They came into town, and they were raising hell. They dared us to come out, dared us, uh, said that they were going to take care of us. So my brothers and and Doc, we decided maybe we need to go out and try to take the guns from them. We started into this area behind the, the corral, and there were about six of them there, which there were four of us, so we figured that was pretty fair odds. <laughs> Doc had his shotgun. So as soon as they... Got started to get closer to them. Let's just say they said a few vile words about us, and looked like they were gonna they were going for their guns. Well, Doc takes a shot at one, kills him, and all hell breaks loose. We stood our ground. We kept. The gunfight going probably lasted about 25, 30 seconds in all. When it was over, my brother was hit in the shoulder. I had had bullets go through my coat. Doc was fine. But three of them lay on the ground bleeding out and dead. The other three took off trying to save their hides. It was... It was kind of a nasty thing. Was there any way the gunfight could have been avoided? Not really. I know the law says that if it's not self-defense, if you could avoid a gunfight, if you started it. But not really sure who started it. I think it was them that went for the gun first. Pretty sure of it as I look back. Doc Daphne took the first shot. He wasn't going to play around with him. And that buckshot does do a job on a person. But the reality is that there was just a lot of nastiness and hatred there. The cowboys were violent people. They were robbing cattle throughout. And it, it was simply a matter of time. We'd have had to go get them later anyway. So the best we got it done when we did. So why were you arrested for murder after the gunfight? Well, in those days, there were a lot of things that uh, weren't on the up and up. The Cowboys definitely had some friends. Those friends decided that they would file charges that the gunfight could have been avoided. Uh, We were acquitted of it. Thank God the people did understand that... uh, that we were doing what was best for the community. Why was Dodge City, Kansas, described as the wickedest little city in the West? Well, Dodge City wasn't real big, so it did meet the... It was little. And 
the cowboys would come in off the Chisholm Trail. They would drive in those cattle cross country, hadn't seen other people, been around any women or anything for quite a while. So there was a lot of violence. It was, had a lot of women in town. Wasn't exactly a place where everyone went to church on Sunday morning. And while, the, while they were driving on the Chisholm, it was one hell of a place. <laughs> Did you ever earn your living as a professional gambler? And will you tell us about living that lifestyle? I did. I was a pretty good gambler. Did it all my life, basically. You would get a lot of people would come into town that thought they knew how to gamble. Now, keep in mind, a cowboy was going to be paid when they get, when the when the drive was over. So they would have a lot of money. They'd come into town, get drunk want to play poker, wouldn't be as sound the players as they should have been sober. So there was a lot of money to be made gambling with, uh, gambling with the other cowboys and people at the time. It was, you had to be careful. You get into a lot of fights with drunk people that have just lost their money. But, it was definitely safer than being a lawman. In 1882, gunman killed your brother Morgan. Will you tell us how his murder occurred? This was left over from the corral battle. We were in the billiard parlor. Morgan was taking a shot on the table. The cowards fired through the door and, and hit him and killed him. They took off. We knew who it was. We had heard that they were bragging that they were going to kill all of us because of what we did in the gunfight. It was, I love my brother a lot. Morgan and Virgil, they were good men. When they bushwhacked him like that, I knew that there was going to be revenge taken. Yes, what did you do after your brother was killed? Got a small posse of friends together. Doc was with us. We started tracking them. Eventually, we brought each one of them down. Didn't give any mercy to them. We gave them the same thing that they gave my brother. They did not exactly have a trial, and... What happened to them is exactly what they deserved. You were a multi-talented man. One of your talents was refereeing prize fights. How were prize fights fought in the late 1800s? Much different than they are today. They were bare knuckle. The fighters did not wear gloves, and the end of the round would come when one of them was knocked down. When they got up, give them a little break, and they'd be back at it fighting again. The fighters were incredibly tough. I had studied boxing myself, and it's part of what helped me get along all through the years as well. But I found out that I enjoyed refereeing prize fights. There was big money would be bet on these fighters, and you would have these prize fights would draw many, many people. Okay. You opened the Dexter Saloon in Nome, Alaska. Will you tell us what it was like during the gold rush in Alaska? A lot like the gold rush in California, just a hell of a lot colder. Nome was basically a tent town. When we got there, we figured that the best money could be made by not trying to chase the gold but by opening a saloon. We had one of the most popular saloons in town, made good money at it. Nome was definitely a very 
dangerous place to be. But with our background and our reputation, not many people tested us in our own saloon. (laughs) I understand that. Uh, You refereed a famous fight between Bob Fitzsimmons and Tom Sharkey. Will you tell us what happened in that fight? The fight was a big deal. Basically the equivalent of the championship in these days. Sharkey and Fitzsimmons teed off. Over 10,000 people were watching. I mean, it was a big deal. Fitzsimmons was the better fighter. And he had Sharkey on the ropes. He was knocking him down. All of a sudden, Sharkey hits Fitzsimmons with, or I'm sorry, I got it backwards. Fitzsimmons hit Sharkey with a knockout blow. Now, Fitzsimmons was famous for this shot that he would give to the upper chest area and the heart area, and it would knock a person out. So he hit Sharkey, but this time, from what I saw, it was a low blow. Now, there weren't many rules, but you couldn't hit a guy in the uh, low area. Sharky goes down screaming, screaming foul, foul. And from my angle, it looked like it was. So I call foul, and I called the fight in favor of Sharky. Well, all the money was bet on Fitzsimmons, and the people were really unhappy and accused me of making a a bad call and that the fight was fixed. I can assure you that it wasn't. It was, in my eyes, he hit him low. It was probably a marginal call, but I called it the way that I saw it. When you're in a ring with two guys that are trying to kill each other with their fists. You're watching what you can, and you're doing what you can. But no, the fight was not fixed. Okay. In your later years, you acted as a consultant for Western movies. Will you tell us about that experience? Yeah, I lived, we moved to California, and the Western movies were very, very popular in those days. I acted as a consultant, was a good friend with uh, Ted Mix, big cowboy at the time. They would ask me how things were were done in my day. I'd try to tell them, and then they'd basically ignore me and do what they wanted anyway. <laughs> what do you think as you watch modern Western movies? I'm astonished by the technologies. I can't believe some of the things that they do now in the movies. A lot of what they do is is actually more historic, historically accurate than it was in my time. But westerns don't seem to be as popular as they were. Maybe they'll come back again. Yeah, I loved them when I was a kid. My dad and I watched them every night of the week. Um, Thank you so much, Wyatt, for joining us. Do you have a final message for our listeners? Yes. I would like to thank you for allowing me to speak. I did try to do my best as a law enforcement agent. There were times that I did some marginal things. I did a lot of things in my life that I probably shouldn't have done. Went to many of the areas of the gold rush, Probably shouldn't have had those brothels, but I was doing a service for the boys. Law enforcement people, the honest people respected them. The bad people wanted to kill us. You need to protect your law enforcement people. They are the only ones that are standing between you and you not having a happy life, to say the least. So thanks for allowing me to speak. Enjoyed being here. And we enjoyed having you. Thank you. 
Uh, Bill Cody was born in 1846 and died in 1917 at the age of 70. Known as Buffalo Bill, he was the American soldier. He was a bison hunter and a showman. He was a rider for the Pony Express at the age of 15, fought for the Union during the Civil War, served as an Indian scout during the Indian Wars, earned a Medal of Honor, and is known for his Wild West shows. He was a very busy man. Bill, thank you so much for joining us. What was your role in the Utah War? I acted as a guide for the Union Army. You may not be familiar with the Utah War, but 1858, Buchanan, president, thought that the Mormons were going to side with the Confederates, and he sent an expedition to Salt Lake City to to ensure that it didn't take place. Mormons didn't think a whole lot of it, and there was some minor skirmishes and fighting took place. But I acted as a scout for the Army on that expedition. Okay, you rode for the Pony Express. Will you tell us about the Pony Express and just how it worked? Keep in mind that this was in the days before the telegraph. They, if you wanted a letter delivered, you'd have to put it on a stagecoach or on a ship that would take a month to get from, it would take several months to get from New York to California. What we did is we set up way stations where we'd have horses kept. Riders would ride between these way stations and would carry the mail. It was through very difficult country. It was right at the beginning of the Civil War. The We would guarantee that we could deliver a letter from New York to California in 10 days. Now, that doesn't seem much now. that It's a millisecond. But in those days, that was as quick as it could be. It only We only lasted for, I guess, a year and a half. Telegraph replaced us because they could send messages over the wire. But it was a very, very dangerous way of life. The, what did, I'm sorry. The Indians didn't think a whole lot of us riding through their territory and quite often thought of as moving targets. What exactly was your role in the Pony Express? I started out as an apprentice building corrals and the buildings that the agents would sleep in. Finally got them to let me do a little bit of riding, not a whole lot, but at the end of the time, I was acting as a as an express rider. Okay, you enlisted in the Union Army at the age of 17. What was your role in the Army at that time? Scouting. I had always been very good at knowing the locations. We were, there was a lot going on at the time. Uh, I did a lot of Riding in the wagons, moving away. The, every, keep in mind that you had to carry everything with you in those days. So when the army moved, they would have a wagon train with them. I would drive some of the wagons, but I also would help hunt. If you wanted fresh meat in those days when when you were on excursion, you would have to kill it. And I was a very, very good shot. So I would also work at bringing in the food. Yes, and then you carried that on in 1867. You began hunting buffalo. Uh, Why did you begin such an occupation, and how many buffalo do you think you killed? This was the time that they were building the railroad, and there was a huge demand for food. There was also a demand for buffalo hides. They made warm coats. They did many, many things. Hard to tell just how many I really killed in my lifetime. I would guess close to 5,000 buffalo. Okay. In 1868, you returned to the Army service as a scout. Will you tell us what it was like being an Army scout during the Indian Wars? 
very dangerous. It, by 1868, it dawned on the Indians that their way of life was going to be changed by the white man, and they had very little say over what was taking place. Keep in mind that the white man kept going out there and making treaties with the Indians. For instance, they made a treaty that the Black Hills was going to be remain sacred. Well, it was until they discovered gold, and that was the end of that. The Indians were generally peaceful. There was they until you would break your, your word with them. Indians were pretty honorable people. When they would make a treaty or make a promise, they would generally live up to it. It was always the white man that was breaking the treaties, that was doing, th- that was going against the promises that were made. When you had an Indian as an enemy, you had a serious enemy. They were wonderful fighters. They were great horsemen. And when you were serving as a scout, quite often you were out in front of the rest of the of the troops. You were trying to find out where the enemy was located, just the same as they were trying to find out where you were located. So being an Army scout was incredibly dangerous. Bill, what were your personal feelings towards the Indians? I felt that the Indians were getting a raw deal. I knew that we had to fight them. We couldn't have them killing the settlers. But if you treated them honestly, they would treat you honestly. I was, as I grew older, I had a lot more respect for them than I did when I was younger and fighting them. But if you treated them honestly, you generally did not have a problem. What would you say about the way Indians are treated today? It's abomination. You still have these poor people living on the res- on reservations. They can't get jobs. Alcoholism's a terrible thing. It's it's just this very very sad thing for the Indians. They've been treated this way for almost two hundred years. Probably not going to change. Yes, that is very sad. What role did Ned Buntline play in your life? Ned was kind of like a publicist. He would write books and tell stories. Quite often what Ned would print would be a bit far from the truth. Ned was known to exaggerate a bit, and of course I was known to exaggerate a bit. But he would write these books, and the stories would go back east, and these people would pay 10 cents to buy a dime novel. He did many things. He helped me set up and promote the Wild West show. He, a lot of the success that I had, I owe to Ned Buntline. Tell us about that Wild West show. Old people back east were enthralled by what was taking place in the western, in the west. Things had started to quiet down. It wasn't the really early Wild West at that point. But they they still wanted to hear about Indians. They wanted to hear about the exploits of some of the great people. We formed up a group, and we took the west to the east. We wound up even going to Europe with it. It was, if I must say so myself, a very, very good show. We lasted almost 30 years touring different parts of the world with it. I had some of the best Indian riders in the country, some of the best cowboys, trick shots. We would do reenactments. We would pretend Indians would attack wagon trains or settlers' cottages. It was show business, but we did a lot to educate the people of the world about about at least what they would believe the West was. What was your relationship with Wild Bill? Bill and I were good friends. 
I met him early in the guiding days. He was a young guide, same as I was. He was a good man. I got along really well with him. Once things started to quiet down in the West, I even had him join the show for a bit. But as they say with his nickname, Wild Bill, acting wasn't really what he was going to do. He he was actually quite bashful in front of a crowd like that. So, wonderful man. Did a awful lot for a lot of people. Yes. Annie Oakley was part of your show. Just how good a shot was she? She was an incredible shot. She could hit small targets by firing with the gun rifle over her shoulder. You could throw coins in the air and she could hit them with bullets. She was she was one of the best shots that I was ever associated with, man or female. How did you get Sitting Bull to participate in your show with 20 of his warriors? Sitting Bull had been put on a, had surrendered at this point and was on a reservation. He was very, very upset. He was very unhappy. I had been friends with, I had met him, made friends with him, and he trusted me. I told him that it would be possible for him to live in some ways like he did in the old days with some of his warriors if he would travel with me. He did it for a short period of time, but he was a true gentleman. He was honest. He was truthful. And he was so abused by the white man. What was your opinion on women's women's suffrage? I thought that women should be totally equal with men. When I had women in the Wild West show, I paid them exactly the same as I paid <clears throat> paid the men in the show. If a woman has the, the ability, she should have the right. Where is your body buried? I'm actually buried outside of Denver at the at the, in the grave site. Okay. As an army scout, you earned the medal of honor. Will you tell us what you did to earn that medal? Well, this was during the Indian Wars, and they asked me to be a courier and deliver this important message. I took the, I took the message, and I rode between multiple forts. The Indians were after us. One time, we, at, at one point of the, of the mission, we had to take our boots off, and walk in the quiet. We were attacked by the Indians, and we actually lost our boots. In, I wasn't keeping track, and it seemed like it was an awful long ways. But after it was all over, the officers figured that I had traveled over 350 miles in about 60 hours. And sadly, when I didn't have my boots, I had to walk the last 35 of those miles in my bare feet. I was well beat up. Needless to say, my feet weren't in the best of shape. But the officers did give me a medal of honor for it. They said how brave I was to do it. And when it got into those Dima novels, it did an awful lot for us. You definitely earned that medal. Thank you so much for joining us, Bill. Do you have a final message for us? I hope that all the people that are listening out there take time to learn a bit about what we did in the West. The West was not an easy place. It was a very, very difficult place to live, incredibly dangerous. Think of the early guys that went out, the fur traders, the ones that had to follow the Indian trails. Once gold or silver was was found, then it was a free-for-all. The lawmen had their hands full trying to control the violence. The cowboys, they were on these long cattle drives. Many of them were rough and tumble as well. Many of them were not educated. Everyone carried a gun. 
Now you can imagine being in an environment where half the guys are drunk, all of them are carrying guns, each one think they're tougher than the other one, and then you got Indians chasing you on top of that. The American pioneers were incredibly brave and incredibly strong. Think about traveling 1,500 miles in a wagon or on horseback to get across the country. They did, we all did many things we shouldn't have done. What we did to the buffalo was a disgrace. What we did to the Indians was a disgrace. But it was done in the name of progress. Things are always done against people in the name of progress. It's taking place today. There are still many people that are living in, in poverty. In many areas, there are still many, many problems. Many people need help. In my day, many of the settlers had trouble feeding themselves. They had to be self-sufficient. Today, because of what your government's doing, many people are having trouble feeding themselves again. Many people are taking advantage of the, of, of the police. Many people do not respect the military. The military is the only thing that's keeping the wolves off the shores of America. Respect the military and the police. You will not be able to exist without them. So thank you for letting us come tonight. I hope that you enjoyed hearing a little bit about the West, the true West. What you see in the movies often isn't what we went through. So thank you. God bless all of you. Hang in there and keep America strong. Thank you so much. I've definitely enjoyed speaking with the three of you, You're three really wonderful souls. Okay. Next week, we're going to be channeling three individuals related to the war for Texas independence in the Alamo. We're going to speak with Sam Houston, Jim Bowie, and Davy Crockett. They were all incredibly brave, all incredibly strong people. All that gave their lives fighting for freedom. Houston will be very interesting to talk to because he is the one that defeated the Mexicans and basically pulled it out of his butt to beat them. So anyway, join us next week. Don't forget it. You're going to enjoy it. You can submit questions or suggestions for future shows through our email, channelinghistoryonparax at gmail.com. My ninth book, Messages of Prophet Muhammad's available. My eighth book was Messages of God for a Modern World. They're all available on Amazon. They're in Kindle. They're in ebook. They are available for you to read and to hopefully enjoy and learn from. I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed our guests as much as I did. And God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. Okay, folks. Don't miss the show next week. It's going to be a good one. Thank you for listening, and please join us on Sundays on the Parax Radio Network. Thanks for listening to Channeling History. Tune in again next week for another electrifying episode as we never know who will make an appearance or who will come through the portal. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2020. Our story begins by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com. Incompetech.com.